Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Uh, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program here uh, at CSIS. We are delighted. Uh, every once in a while, our timing is perfect, and our timing was perfect because we understand um, that the President, President Obama, will be giving a major address on Thursday at the National Defense University on the legal framework and policy for drone attacks, as well as is for Guantanamo Bay. So I couldn't think of a better timed event to help us tease out the most important issues and the important questions. And there is one international organization that uh, uh, is at the heart of the important parts of the speech that President Obama will give, and that is the International Committee for the Red Cross. We are delighted to uh, welcome Vice President Christine Barely um, uh, from the ICRC. Uh, Madame Barely was uh, elected to the upper house of the Swiss Parliament in 1991 and has served in leading roles in the Parliament from chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee to uh, uh, serving on a variety of committees of important security policy, economic, and legal issues. Uh, since retiring from politics in 2003, Madame Barely has uh, served as the head of Swiss Medic, the Swiss um, supervisory authority for therapeutic products and uh, formerly uh, director of the School of Inter Engineering and Information Technology at Bern University of Applied Sciences. So we bring the politics, the science, and pull that all together. And Madame Barely will provide us with uh, her thoughts on the evolution of the battlefield. And after Madame Barely's uh, remarks, we will turn the microphone over to our very own Jim Lewis, who is the Senior Fre Fellow and Director of the Technology and Public Policy Program here at CSIS, or what I affectionately call Jim, our cyber guru. Uh, Jim is a former Foreign Service Officer, member of the Senior Executive Service, and has held prominent positions at both the State Department and the Commerce Department. Um, he is really the master of understanding the intersection of technology, innovation, and national power. He has served uh, in, in areas of distinction at the UN Group of Governmental Experts on Information Security. He has run track to um, cybersecurity dialogues with the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. So very well steeped to offer some reflections and commentary after Madame Barely's uh, presentation. I have to say, as I was thinking uh, about uh, this morning in our discussion, I sort of thought, what would Henri Dunant, the founder of the ICRC, over 150 years ago, as he stumbled uh, literally across a battlefield in Italy, the Battle of Solferino, what if 150 years later he would have stumbled upon a village in Pakistan's federal admi administrative tribal areas, Fatah, after a drone attack? where there was no one wearing uniforms, there was no, uh, the civilians were harmed, what would he have made of that particular issue? And again, it points to how international humanitarian law changes and evolves to today's challenges. So that's a thought to think about, and maybe Christine, you can help us think through that a bit with your presentation. Again, welcome after both Christine and Jim provide their comments. We'll do a little moderated Q&A and then open the floor for your questions and comments. And again, welcome, Christine, and thanks to the ICRC office for allowing us this special opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, for your warm welcome and for your ongoing support also for the ICRC. I'm indeed thrilled to be with you today here in Washington and to have the possibility to speak uh, about the, um, the subject that has mentioned, and I thank also the SCIS for hosting this event today. The role the SCIS plays in promoting strategic insight and bipartisan policy solutions today is vitally important also for us and the discussion we have. Let me now say a few words about remotely piloted aircrafts, usually known as drones, and also about cyber warfare. In its operational, legal, and policy work, the ICRC is facing several challenges linked to the evolving nature of contemporary battlefields. This includes the development of remotely controlled aircrafts, of drones, and of course, cyber warfare. A common feature of these technological developments is that they put a never expanding distance between operators and the traditional battlefield. 
the deep controversy around the use of combat drones has produced two opposing camps. Simply put, defenders of drones say their relative precision greatly minimizes the risk of collateral damage. Critics, on the other hand, say drone strikes can constitute extrajudicial killing, especially outside conflict zones, and that hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians have died in such strikes. Other points to the psychological effects of drones continuously ho hovering in the sky. The ICRC endeavors to assess drones' effects and whether they might be the result of violations of IHL. I'm, however, not in a position to make a general assessment of whether drone strikes lead to more or less civilian casualties. Indeed, drones are typically used in remote terrain where staff security concern, concerns hamper the ability to collect first-hand information, including for the ICRC. There are also claims that drones' technological features may increase opportunities to attack. There might be less hesitation, both at the political level and at the level of the operator to fire a drone strike than a cruise missile. It has also been alleged that an increase in the likelihood of attack may cause an associated rise in civilian exposure to harm. This is, in my view, an important question, but from a political perspective more than from one of IHL. Among the various issues raised by drones, I will focus on the lawfulness of extraterritorial use of force and the application to drones of the rules of IHL governing the conduct of hostilities. Most questions with regard to drone strikes have been raised about the lawfulness of the use of lethal force against individuals who were deemed to be participating in an ongoing NIAC, non-international armed conflict, from the territory of a non-belligerent state. Under one school of thought, a person directly participating in his hostilities in relation to a specific ongoing NIAC carries that armed conflict with him to an other non-belligerent state and remains targetable under AHL. Pursuant to other views, which the ICRC shares, the notion that a person carries a NIAC with him to the territory of a non-belligerent state should not be accepted. The propositions that harm could lawfully be inflicted on civilians in the non-belligerent state in operation of the IHL principles of proportionality because an individual sought by another state is in their midst would in effect mean recognition of the concept of a global battlefield. And while one thinks essentially of the US strikes against Al-Qaeda, what would that mean for other NIACs? People involved in NIAC are perhaps more mobile, crossing borders more easily, finding refuge in other states. Would this view not lead to recognize a multitude of global battlefields all over the globe? The ICRC thus believes that the lawfulness of such use of force would be subject to assessment based on international human rights law rules and law enforcement, which do not preclude the resort to force, but foresee that force must be used as a measure of last resort and only when strictly unavoidable to protect life. Given the strict limits posed by the law enforcement framework, it would appear that drone strikes could be re relied on outside of armed conflict only in exceptional circumstances. Turning to what IHL says about the use of drones in armed conflict, the starting point is that it contains no specific rule on drones. There is no specific prohibition on their use as a weapon platform, and the rules are thus no different from those that apply to manned aircraft. Drones, as they exist today, still require that human operators fire the weapon concerned. The responsibility for respecting IHL clearly belongs to the drone operators, their commanders, and the relevant party to the conflict for all actors whose conduct is attributable to it 
in particular its armed forces, as well as other agencies or persons acting under its instructions, direction, or control. It is a pivotal rule of IHL that parties to an armed conflict must at all times distinguish between civilians and combatants, and that attacks may only be directed against combatants. Who is deemed to be a lawful target is the subject of much debate. In the ICRC's view, members of state armed forces as well as persons who perform a continuous combat function for a non-state party to the conflict are not civilians and are thus not protected, protected against direct attack. All other persons are civilians. They become lawful target only for such times as they take a direct part in hostilities. In case of doubt, the person must be presumed to be protected from attack. Thus, the fact that the military age male happens to be in a strike zone without more information is not sufficient to conclude that he may therefore be lawfully targeted. Even an armed military aged male, as in many cultures men routinely bear arms. IHL also requires that each party to a conflict takes all feasible precautions in the choice of means and methods of warfare with a view to avoiding or minimizing civilian casualties. Because drones possess sophisticated sensors and are able to conduct surveillance over a given area for an extended period of time, they have the potential to help direct attack more precisely against military objectives. They also provide their operators with more options with regards to the timing of the attack, which again could help avoid civilian casualties. Drones therefore widen the range of precautionary measures that may be taken in advance of an attack. Whether the use of armed drones does indeed offer these advantages will, will depend on the specific circumstances. This issue is the subject of an ongoing debate due, among other things, to lack of information on the effects of most drone strikes. Some have argued that abuses are more likely when a person is disconnected and at a distance from a potential adversary, but there is, to our knowledge, at present no evidence that this is true or more frequent in the particular case of drone operators. Also, the fact that usually crews are physically on the territory of the state party to the conflict that operates the drone not where the strike occur, occurs does not change the status of its crew members under IHL. They are not protected by IHL against direct attack, attack if they are part of the state armed forces, have a continuous combat function, or for such time as they directly participate in hostilities. Distance from the potential adversary is actually not entirely novel compared to other weapon systems that are also operated from a distance, such as cruise missiles. In summary, there is nothing specific to drone systems that would make them, as such, unable to implement the IHL rules on targeting. The lawfulness of particular operation is to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and will very much depend on the overall apl applicable legal framework information available to the operators and their willingness to apply the relevant law. Let me now turn to cyber warfare. Cyber has opened up a potentially new war fighting domain, the first man-made theater of war characterized by its interconnectivity. From a technological view point of view, cyber means and methods of warfare do not seem to be really comparable to any other existing means and methods of warfare. Let me first clarify what I'm talking about. A large proportion of operations colloquially termed cyber attacks are in fact network exploitation operations carried out for the purpose of illicit information gathering and occur outside the context of armed conflict. While such operations can have very important consequences for the targeted cooperation, they are cyber security issues rather than cyber warfare. They are not governed by IHL, but by notably telecommunication and intellectual property law. When I talk of cyber warfare or cyber attacks, I do not mean such operations 
but rather means and methods of warfare that rely on information technology and are used in the context of armed conflict. While the military potential of cyberspace is not yet fully understood, it appears that cyber attacks against transportation system, electricity networks, dams, and chemical or nuclear plan plantation uh, plan plants are technologically possible. Such attacks would have wide-reaching consequences, resulting in high number of civilian casualties and significant damage. It is thus our role to recall that in an armed conflict, all feasible measures must be taken to spare civilians and civilian objects. Indeed, means and methods of warfare which resort to cyber technology are subject to IHL just as any new weapons. There is no legal vacuum in cyberspace. Applying IHL to cyberspace, however, raises specific challenges. The main one being the interconnectedness of cyberspace. There is only one cyberspace and the same network routes and cables are, sharing, are shared by civilian and military users. When you, are, you or me store data through cloud computing, we don't know where these data are stored and what other data are stored there that might render the network used a military objective. That might make it impossible to distinguish between military and civilian computer systems when launching a cyber attack. Also, a, part, a party about to launch a cyber attack must do everything feasible to assess whether the attack may be expected to cause incidental harm to civilians and civilian networks or objects which would be excessively in relation to the direct and concrete military advantage and in such case not conduct the attack. But in cyberspace, it, is it possible to appropriately assess such incidental effects, including an indirect ones? Like for drones, the development of cyber capabilities may also have positive effects in specific circumstances and if used in a law abiding manner. For instance, it might be less damaging to disrupt through a cyber operation certain services used for military and civilian purposes than to destroy such infrastructure completely through a bombardment. In such cases, the principle of precaution arguably imposes an obligation on states to choose the less harmful means to achieve their military aim. This being said, a holistic re reflection is warrant to fully consider the risk in terms of the potentially devastating humanitarian consequences that cyber operations also entail that I mentioned earlier. These challenges underscore the importance that states that would develop or acquire means and methods of cyber warfare access their lawfulness under IHL as for any weapons. That's indeed the only way to make sure that their armed forces will be able to abide by their obligation when resorting to such new cyber weapons or methods of warfare. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. <coughs> Christine, I'm sure we will. Jim, please. Uh, thank you, Heather. Um, although saying I'm well steeped in the issues makes me sound like a teabag. Um, and I would like to start by thanking the ICRC. Uh, I always found them to be uh, valuable uh, companions in uh, many of the conflict areas where you might happen to be working. And so I've always felt sort of a soft spot for them. I'm not sure they always approved of what we were doing, but, you know, still. And that was a very clear statement. Um, what I want you to think about is a continuum of weapons from edged weapons all the way to nuclear weapons, right? And so what we want to do is look at these new weapons and say where on this continuum from edged to nuclear do they fall? And some of the things we might want to think about are lethality, right? How lethal are the weapons? Cyber and drones are very different. Range, uh, similar range as their cyber's longer range, and precision. So these are three criteria for thinking about weapons and how we would approach them from a their use and their, their, how we would think about them from a legal perspective, lethality, range, precision. Um, the development of long-range attack capabilities has been uh, ongoing since at least World War I, right, with the invention of the aircraft. And the new factor now might be the automation in some ways. And this, again, is not new from the 1960s and 70s. We can see weapons automated where the operator uh, may, after launch, cede control to the actual device, right? 
So these are not new things, either drones uh, or cyber attack. And this is, again, consistent with the pattern of using technology to improve weapons performance, right? Um, the, quest, the question, and I think that's why we're here today, is how do we make these new weapons consistent in their use with uh, international humanitarian law, and in particular with the laws of armed conflict? Now, I will say the U.S. has, for drones, uh, articulated uh, a series of thresholds that would be used to justify an attack, that there's uh, the use of drones, that there's imminent threat of a violent attack, that capture is not possible, and that the use of drones is consistent with the laws of armed conflict. So if you think about these, uh, these three thresholds, which I, the President may very well elaborate, he'll probably also announce um, a movement of responsibility away from the CIA. Uh, if you think about these three thresholds, though, many of the more arcane scenarios that you've heard about tend to go away. Uh, capture, imminent threat, uh, consistent with LOAC, right? Uh, an important part of this is the uh, combatant, the target has to have combatant status. And this, of course, is one of the uh, arguments here um, when we talk about collateral damage, right? I can see why insurgents are unhappy with the use of drones, right? Because it denies them a sanctuary. And so it would be natural if you were an insurgent to begin a political campaign to try and restrict the ability to, to um, penetrate your sanctuary and take advantage of it. When you're in a counterinsurgency campaign, you will find that successful insurgencies depend on having a sanctuary. If you can reduce that sanctuary, if you can make it difficult for them, the chances of their success increase. So this makes drones very attractive in many scenarios, but it also means they'll be the target of objections in their use. Um, the idea that governments where drones operate haven't accepted their use um, so is probably not correct. They may not publicly accept it. Uh, one of the benefits of WikiLeaks is we know that the Pakistani government at the time actually encouraged greater use of drones. It's possible that their behavior has changed, but um, somehow I doubt it. Right? Now, all of this raises two very important issues, both cyber and drone, and this is where we want to think about. Uh, the issues are overflight and neutrality. And overflight sounds like a funny uh, term to use when it comes to networks, but when, let's say, let's just pick a random example. If the U.S. were to do something against China, it would have to transition networks, in many cases, through third countries. In fact, it might choose to do that uh, because of the benefits of perhaps disguising its tracks. And so they're basically passing over uh, a national network through a national territory to carry out an attack. And that would seem to be overflight. Normally, you would get permission. The way the internet is structured now is it's a commercial agreement. One carrier accepts carrier traffic from another carrier without looking at it, right? But that avoids the issue of do we need to think about overflight. There's also the issue of neutrality then. What is the role of neutrals in this? If your attack traverses my network, have I compromised my neutrality? If your attack affects me, and this, this has happened in the real world, um, then how is my neutrality compromised? What are your obligations to neutrals who may be attached? So these are difficult issues that we'll only be able to work through with more experience. The goal for the new weapons is to make them consistent with the laws of armed conflict and with international law. And I'd like to call attention to four uh, principles in particular. Uh, attack should be proportional, right? Um, there has to be distinction. Uh, among the targets. And distinction is important because another way to think about distinction is its commander's discretion, right? If there is overriding military necessity, any target can be attacked, right? And so you are supposed to, under the third principle, though, discrimination, avoid attacks that don't really have a, a military objective or would cause uh, un unwarranted harm to civilians or that are indiscriminate in their nature. Um, I think in both uh, the case of drones and uh, cyber attack, the ability to make these more precise, to better discriminate among targets is one of their attractive features, right? You know, something we don't usually think about. And finally, there's the whole issue of self-defense and how that's interpreted. The use of these things has to be consistent with uh, international law and particularly with the commitments under the UN Charter. So justifying uh, any kind of attack as something under self-defense, as a 
as a necessary for self-defense is important. I will say there is an emerging international consensus on the applicability of international law and sovereign responsibility, particularly for cyberspace. Um, when you see this consensus uh, publicly enunciated will be a political issue. You need to find agreement among the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, and others before everyone will come out and say, but the behavior you see now uh, that people seem to be acting in accordance with is that international laws apply, the laws of armed conflict apply, and sovereign responsibility applies, right? And this will be probably, if there's, there's a remote chance, we'll see some agreement on this announced publicly this summer, perhaps in the fall, but this is the course we're moving on. And that is encouraging because it means that these new weapons will be able to be put into the larger context of international human rights. The one caveat I'd put to this, pardon me, international human rights and international law, the one caveat I'd put to this is involves covert action. Um, international law does not touch upon espionage, right? This is probably a good idea, right? States don't want international law touching on espionage, right? And the privilege of sovereigns in this area is something where there is tacit agreement among nations that we should respect. So covert action may occur outside the framework of international law. This is always a, a, an issue with it, but it is not something that it can be forbidden, right? Sovereigns will not accept forbidding covert action. And then we get into a discussion of when it makes sense from a policy perspective or a political perspective, how we limit its use. Um, I will say that the new weapons in both cases uh, create areas of ambiguity in how the laws of armed conflict should be applied, how the international humanitarian law should be applied. Um, but the way that the laws, the Hague Convention, the Geneva Convention, the UN Charter, that the way they are written, they're flexible. They can accommodate new weapons. This was their intent. Some are more than a century old now, and they have been successfully used to govern all the weapons that have been introduced since the Russo-Japanese War. Um, so international law is flexible. It can accommodate the new weapons. We can think about how to improve this by finding ways to improve precision in their use to limit collateral damage. But at the end of the day, I think we will need uh, for more experience and more um, thinking on how exactly we take new ways of military conflict and put them in the existing framework of international law. So with that, why don't I stop? Jim, thank you. You brewed a very strong cup of tea for us, so thank you very much. Keep our, our game going here. Um, I, I, two questions come to mind, and um, and again, feel, feel free to choose the question or, or to comment on both. Jim, I was struck by your comment, and, and also Christine, you know, the target must have combatant status. and. The challenge, I think, with, within the U.S. government is, you know, to to make that assessment the transparency by which we make that assessment. And I think, Jim, you, you reflected on perhaps uh, hinting at some things that may come out in the president's speech or in follow-on actions about increasing that transparency and accountability, moving, and I would love your reflections on um, what is the right level of assessing that transparency, making sure that the target does have that status, but in a timely way, I mean, the, the, the challenge there. And then I'd like to, Jim, your last comment provoked sort of, we need to have more thinking, more experience in understanding the new technologies and allowing the uh, flexibility and the accommodative process of, of IHL and others. What's the forum for that thinking? How do you bring, and I know you've been tasked with this, how do you bring the countries together to think through this process, where in some ways some of the countries don't necessarily want to have be a transparent thought process of, of how these work? So if you have any reflections and thoughts on how we can uh, advance that thinking, that would be great. And Christina, and any reflections you may have on Jim's comments would be great. You really brewed a, a strong uh, cup of tea, I must say. <laughs> um, I think we, we have to take two things. We have, um, and I use now um, a, a law expression, we have all the discussion about use at bellum. I mean, we have to question ourselves, um, are we working in a domain where the international humanitarian law is applicable because we have 
an armed conflict or we, are we outside a situation of an armed conflict? That's what I tried also to say in my expose. Um, if we are inside a situation of an armed conflict, either an international armed conflict or a non-international armed conflict, then the use of drones, as a matter of fact, follows the same rules as the use of any other arm. I mean, you can, you can use um, a, a plane or, or a missile or, or a drone, and it has to um, respect the same rules if you are acting inside an international armed conflict, or, or a, a non-international armed conflict, one uh, an armed conflict. And there, I think, um, this is perhaps a, a little difference we have in our discussion. If you are out so outside of such a context, then you have domestic law applicable and you have the applicability of human rights law. And there you are in a situation of law enforcement. And I think this is, is quite a difference. And that's perhaps the first, um, the first exercise we have to do when we discuss, we have to take these two things and to separate them. Um, if we are in a situation afterwards of, a, of an, an armed conflict, either an international or a non-international, then we discuss all the things uh, James mentioned, proportionality, yeah. distinction, discrimination, but uh, we are still in the IHL applicability and then we have to look if the person who is targeted is directly participating in the conflict. Either it is a member of the armed forces or it is a member of a, a non-governmental uh, non armed group and or it is a civilian who is not um, normally a member of an armed group but is in this moment directly participating in, hostility, in hostilities. Then it is targetable and um, it can be targeted either by a drone or by another weapon. Um, I think these are the main differences we have to make and um, we look at the situation if we speak of um, an armed conflict in a case-by-case -case basis. Every time you have a situation in a country or in different countries, you have to re evaluate the situation and you have to come to the decision if you can speak of an armed conflict or not. You cannot just make one size fits all and say globally it is over the whole world like this. You have to look at it very specifically in each situation specially. Okay. So perhaps to this first. There, there are a number of difficult issues here. Um, the first is you might remember uh, Mao Zedong said that the objective of the insurgent or the guerrilla was to swim like a fish in the sea of the civilian population, right? And so dis distinguishing between the s innocent civilian population and the legitimate target has always been a problem for insurgencies, and there's a number of strategies for doing it. All of them uh, involve some unpleasantness, so it's difficult to deal with this problem of how do you target the legitimate uh, combatant who may not be in uniform and in many cases will not be in uniform without, while avoiding the civilian target. A problem that probably goes back to the Boer War at least and perhaps even much further, right? Um, that's where I think the point about uh, precision uh, is important and one of the things that may emerge as we gain more experience with these weapons is a, a better ability to um, judge when it's appropriate to use them. If you read accounts of drone strikes, there's that crucial moment where the, the, the decision maker really isn't the operator who pulls the trigger. The decision maker is the intelligence analysts who are looking at the sensor inputs and deciding when the targets are combatants or when they're not. And so that's, and when you've seen some of the errors, the more uh, horrible errors that have occurred, it's been because of these uh, problems with intelligence analysis, so maybe there's some way to improve that. The second issue, and I think this is the one Christine raised, is when is it appropriate to use law enforcement techniques rather than military techniques? And in lots of ways, there's a benefit to approaching 
uh, terrorism as a law enforcement problem. You don't give them the legitimacy of uh, being in a conflict. You don't give them some of the legal protections they get uh, as combatants. There's a benefit to approaching this as a, as a law enforcement issue, but we know that in some cases uh, this isn't possible. So these are some of the issues you want to think about is how do we distinguish the sharks from the fish? When do we decide that it's better to have the uh, police rather than the military? And those are almost always, those are hard in every single war you can think about like this. On the forum for new thinking, um, on the drone side there isn't very much, right? In part because uh, right now only one nation is using them in conflict. Uh, there might be some uh, side discussions, but compared to cyber there's very little discussion of drone. On cyber there's an immense amount of discussion. It's not public and that's a puzzling thing, but there's at least four different international fora that have been discussing um, the rules of cyber warfare for um, more than three years. Right? You have the UN with a group of government experts now in its third round. Right? Uh, second round was successful, first was not. There's other discussions in the uh, disarmament part of the UN. Um, you have this thing called the London process, which talks about responsible state behavior. Uh, first two meetings a little tricky, well, and third meeting coming up in uh, Korea in the fall, uh, but you'll see discussion of what is responsible state behavior. You had a long and very fruitful discussion in the uh, Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, that led to a draft of um, very useful norms and confidence building measures for cybersecurity. It's really regrettable that the OSCE was unable to agree on these. And that was at the very last minute where a, a bilateral problem between the US and Russia derailed what would have otherwise been a very positive effort. Finally, you have the, um, the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, beginning to engage on this, right? And there are others. The OAS uh, is doing this. The, the Organization of African States is doing this. There's, there's a, a wide discussion of how to treat cyber warfare, cyber conflict. What are the norms? Um, that's been ongoing for a few years, and we don't see that matched on the drone side, so it's interesting. And that makes you wonder, the, the cyber discussion, the, the driver there is the fear, the concern that nations have about what is a new source of instability in the international system. And cyber is kind of unbounded for many countries. It's easy to exaggerate the effect. I don't think it's easy to get very dramatic effects out of a cyber attack. But countries don't know, and so it's unbounded risk, and that's why they've all focused on it. You don't see the same thing with uh, drones, and it would be interesting to try perhaps to figure out why. Our next CSIS project. Uh, let me open the floor for uh, discussion and, and comment. Uh, if you could raise your hand, please, and identify yourself and your affiliation. We have some colleagues with microphones, uh, and uh, we'll take a few questions and begin the discussion. I see a question right over here, ma'am. The microphone's coming towards you. Um, yeah, Li Chen from uh, Johns Hopkins Science China Studies. I have uh, two questions here. One is uh, I understand both of you were talking about international armed conflicts. Uh, my first question is, uh, <coughs> well, we, we heard lots of accusations. China have stolen maybe billions of dollars of economic uh, intelligence from the U.S. companies or military. Uh, if th we take th that accusation as a fact, um, that to me is could cause more um, um, you know, um, risks to the U.S. than some military attacks. So given that as a fact, um, how, uh, how could the U.S. Cal do the calculation and, and jump from, um, you know, uh, taking this kind of uh, attacks or risks to an offensive cyber operation? So in t uh, I wonder whether both of you can comment on that. What's the conditions? Uh, what uh, kind of forms the U.S. could do in terms of offensive cyber op uh, uh, operation. My second question is, uh, it's uh, aspiring to hear both of you uh, <laughs> agree that uh, the new weapons could be taken under the existing international law uh, framework. Um, um, my question is, uh, how? what's your thinking about um, the arms control regime for the new weapons? Thank you. Um, what I try to say also is when 
spying is not forbidden, as a matter of fact. It's not, it's not under IHL, and it's not, um, it's not uh, criminalized. And um, when I'm speaking of an, a cyber attack, in this sense, we um, speak of um, an attack by cyber means in the context of an armed conflict, where you have a, a physical destruction of something. Because otherwise, um, it goes much too far. If you would give the right to a counteract attack, also, uh, when we are speaking of, of, of spying and of economical damage, then we would really go very far. And that's why I tried to, to make very clear that when we are speaking of cyber attacks, it's where you have a, a very direct harm in attacking whatever a nuclear plant or, or an electrical grid or something where you really have the danger that uh, persons would be hurt and that you could have really victims in, in, in this sense. And this would be then a cyber attack in, in a context of, of an armed conflict. One of the puzzling things for me when I started uh, looking at this uh, a few years ago was that um, it appeared, and I don't know if this is implicit or explicit, or uh, I think it's explicit. It appeared that nations were careful to stay below the threshold of what an armed attack would be in their use of cyber techniques. And so when you think about it, there's been perhaps only three cyber attacks since the dawn of the internet, three real attacks. And the thresholds are, um, as, as Christine said, there has to be physical damage and there has to be death or casualties. If it doesn't cross that threshold, it's not an attack. Espionage and crime are not attacks. We call everything an attack, but they're not, right? And that limits the ability of a nation to respond, right? That means that this espionage uh, is, and cybercrime are really diplomatic problems, problems in the relations between states, and the solutions have to be diplomatic rather than military. There is this argument about death by a thousand cuts, oh, uh, you know, oh. Uh, I hate it. And um, maybe, maybe what else? Oh, that, that we want to lower the threshold. The, the, some nations that have been the victims of denial of service attacks wanted a lower threshold for a forceful response. Um, probably, probably a bad idea across the board. And the issue here, the fellow that, um, I think he might have been at the ICRC, Pictet, uh, a Swiss jurist, uh, worth looking at. And he had a couple sets of thresholds about scope, duration, intensity. These apply to cyber attacks. So while there are areas of ambiguity, you know, they can be resolved, I think, using Pictet's remarks and by applying existing international law. Uh, so I see this as a diplomatic problem. And there's a range, we've done this before with the Chinese and others. There's a range of diplomatic techniques you can use, right? On arms control, I know that when you talk to American officials, they become very excited when you say arms control and you're not actually supposed to say it, right? And I think one of the reasons for that is that Russians proposed in 1998 a, a very, um, uh, what's a polite word here? A very unusual treaty uh, for controlling cyber war that was unacceptable because it rewrote international law in some ways, right? So there's a reluctance to perceive this as a traditional arms control problem. I will note that in most of the discussions that occur, the arms controllers have an advantage over the technical people. So there's a sense that perhaps non-proliferation, perhaps the development of norms, perhaps this is a useful, useful path to think about. But that's different from formal treaties, uh, you know, formal agreements. I, we're very far away from them. Just perhaps if I can just um, add, I, I mean, IHL, in, in all these domains of new weapons, and it's also in, in the cyber war question like this, it, it follows state practice. And one of the big problems in this discussion about cyber war is that the, the state practice is, is very clandestine. As a matter of fact, you, you don't really know what states are doing. And states do not want you to know what they are doing. <laughs> And that's why it's uh, extremely difficult to, to, to have some state practice and also to get to a, a discussion and to get to some rules of law.
Well, and I, I, what I was going to chime in, just press you a little bit. So, um, in a conflict scenario, uh, and I'm going to use the example of 2008 and the Russian Georgian conflict. Um, does that, at a place where, where cyber, uh, cyber issues came into play, how does that work? And then when you have um, NATO looking at cyber issues and, and things like that and, and trying to understand, as you said, both state practice but as multinational practice, if you will, how do we, how do we think that through a bit and in that particular applied situation? If you take the 2008 Georgian um, example, I, I think there you can speak of, of a cyber attack, but still there, um, the traceability is extremely difficult. This is one of the big questions. I mean, you see that something happens, you see that there is an attack, and you see also that there is harm, but afterwards it's extremely difficult to know from where it came. And uh, if you do not know from where it came, it, it's also extremely difficult to react. So uh, I think that the traceability is, is one of the, the very huge problems in this domain. And then you have, for instance, also the Estonian case and a year before, the, the Georgian case, and there it was more uh, like a, a denial of service attack. And, it, and um, also there, the traceability was extremely difficult. You, you did not know it came from a lot of different people. And um, so the reaction was, was not really possible either. And, and you, it could never be said exactly from, from where it came. And this is one of the huge problems in these cases. Well, it's interesting that if you look at uh, Russian uh, doctrine for the use of uh, cyber techniques, they have an element that is a, a little bit different, or at least expressed differently than our doctrine, and that is the idea of what we can call a political shaping, both before and during the conflict, to shape the political opinions of third parties, right, and also to affect the uh, uh, morale of the uh, target, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the opponent, right? So the Russians, um, consciously intend to use cyber techniques as they did in Georgia for uh, uh, this political effect. And that's different from the kinetic effect. We always think about kin kinetic effect with cyber. We think about intelligence, we think about kinetic. It's, it's useful to think about how, at least in this case, you have an opponent who's very skillful at using it to shape the politics of these things. Um, the, the issue I'd put before you is uh, the, the problem of attribution, right? And attribution is getting easier, right? And the ability to attribute is improving. Right? And currently, a few nations have a very high ability to attribute. This is how we know it's China, right? But that will become more common in the future. So what will that mean for how we think about these conflicts when it is much more easy to attribute the source of attack? The one benefit, I'd say right off the bat, is it will make it easier to fit this into the context of international law. I mean, the, the biggest um, cyber attack probably we had to, what we heard of is, is Stuxnet. Yes. And, and um, this is, was for sure a cyber attack, but there also the attribution is, is quite um, uh, often discussed and we have read a lot of things in the media, but it's not, it's not very clear as a matter of fact, but, uh, but this was quite a, quite a strong cyber attack. Also, the, the Aramco um, attack in 2012 on, on, on the, the Saudi uh, oil company. But there also, with, um, the, um, the traceability is, is very difficult. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Jeffers from the National Intelligence Council. Uh, I think it's interesting to have these two subjects discussed at the same time from the same podium. I, I think it's, it, what, what it illustrates, for example, is if you accept uh, Madame Birley's point that I think uh, identification of exactly who it is that's engaged in armed conflict is a key point, I, and I think that is a key point. When you discuss it in that context, in the context of UAVs, you have one kind of discussion, and then when you discuss it in the context of cyber, as Mr. Lewis did, where you know, things aren't really attacks unless they actually result in damage, uh, then you, you have a different kind of conversation because it seems to me that that the uh, the point about defining what it is, what what a, a, a combatant is, is very important. I mean, if you, I think in some ways your your point about uh, Mao Zedong 
you know, sharks swimming in the, or the insurgents swimming in the sea of the people, you got to pick out, do better job with intelligence analysis to pick out the sharks from the fish. In some ways, that kind of obscures the problem in, in a way because, you know, the U.S. government, for example, didn't seem to have any problem designating Anwar al-Awlaki as, uh, as a combatant, even though there's no evidence that he actually engaged in physical armed combat. He, he was not that person. Uh, so I guess I would look for your reactions as to how this definition crosses the boundary between different kinds of, of conflict and weaponry, uh, because it seems to me that the definition of this armed combatant or participating in armed conflict is really a key point, and how you apply that consistently and use it for international law um, is, a, is a big challenge, it strikes me. I'm, I think you really have a point. I mean, and, and it's, it's um, in every case where you have to take a decision, I think extremely difficult because you have to do um, like two um, definitions. You have first to look, are we in a situation of a non-conflict or not? And if you say, yes, we are in a situation of a non-conflict, you have to look if the targeted person is participating at the, 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 the conflict and is really, in this sense, uh, targetable. And I'm, I'm fully aware that um, it is much easier to speak about things like this when you are on a podium or you are uh, somewhere um, and have a nice discussion between, between friends uh, than w when you are um, behind the, the button where you have to decide if you have to shoot or not to shoot. I'm fully aware of this, but still I think um, to think it through in, in, in theory is, is extremely important and, and gives you also the strength afterwards to decide when, when you have to decide. If you, you have a clear idea in, in your head when it is possible to do something, then also when you are under stress, you, you probably take a better decision. Jim. Um, so the example I think many people use is uh, suppose there was a German-American working at Pienemann developing the V2, right? and um, he had not uh, actually engaged in combat, right? Uh, would he have been a legitimate target? And the answer is clearly yes. Right? Uh, so the Alawaki case is perhaps the most difficult case we have, and it, it raises many difficult issues. There's areas of ambiguity. It makes everyone uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, I think you can make a justification for it, right? That's not popular, but you, it could be the same way that the German-American working at Pienemund on the V2 could be a legitimate target. So could this person. There are a lot of gray areas here. I'm reluctant to take anything off the table uh, while we are in a position where we still face significant threats and while we are in a position where there has not been the kind of public discussion and thinking we need about these issues. You can go back and forth on Alawaki. It's probably not something you'd want to do very often but in, you could explain why it was justified in view of the risk. So I think this is one where you do need more analysis, more discussion. And the touchstone for me, and the reason I think we have both drones and cyber up here, we could probably tag in other weapons. You know, you're gonna see robotic weapons, you may see other kinds of weapons. Um, the touchstone here is how do you take the new military developments and put them into the context of existing international law? Are there places where international law needs to be modified? The Russians and the Chinese used to argue they've stopped. The information was a weapon. And I always said to them, sure, I get it. You drop the Sunday Times from a tall building and let someone, that's a weapon. But otherwise, it's not. It's a, it's a distortion of international law to say mm -hmm. information is a weapon. And they had clearly a political goal. But there are places where there are, will be ambiguities. And working through that will have to be something we'll need to do both at a national level and an international level. I'm just reluctant to say, we should not do something against a target that you could define as legitimate. I, I'm struck as we were talking about the attribution on the cyber issue, and I participated in some gaming exercises and things like that, that in some ways policymakers and analysts, they, in some ways they have to practice this and practice the decision-making challenges that in the moment as you're, you know, quick, 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 pace to feel more comfortable both with uncertainty mm -hmm. 
which is very uncomfortable in this when you have mm -hmm. this much at stake. How do you practice? Uh, how do you get policymakers? And and I would take this on a, again a multinational uh, stage and thinking of NATO and others where you have to practice that attribution question and how it works. How do you do that? Or is there a place that you can practice it? Obviously, nations can practice that and their own institutions. But how do you develop that expertise? I don't know, Jim or Christine, if you have any comments. Um, as a matter of fact, I do not really know how they do it. I have some experiences where I see that um, policymakers discuss this really um, very deeply, and I know also that the militaries do it. Huh? The militaries have also a lot of discussions uh, with their lawyers, as a matter of fact, when you, when you are discussing with them. So they very often tell you that this was one of the biggest changes they lived through in the last um, 20, 30 years. Now, um, behind every commander, you have his lawyer. And this was not like this probably in the Second World War. So um, these are things which, which happen. And, and um, I'm very aware that in the most of cases, people really try to take very, um, very thought through decisions because um, I am also um, sure that people do not want to do, mostly do not want to do something illegal. And it's extremely, it's extremely difficult to, to be in such a situation and to decide. And that's why it's extremely um, important also what you are say saying, that you um, exercise those things before you have to, to, to do it in, 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 in combat. I mean, that's, that's extremely important. Some of you probably heard this, but it, about a year ago when the Sanger article on uh, Stuxnet came out, uh, I was talking to some Chinese colleagues, and I said to them, hey, were you, you know, were you surprised by the article? And they said, no, we always knew it was you. And I said, oh, yeah, how do you know that? And they said, well, first of all, whoever designed Stuxnet had, had so many lawyers involved. There's only one country that has that many lawyers involved in it. <laughs> <laughs> So I said to them, well, what about you? Don't you have to deal with lawyers? And they said, uh, uh, not yet, but it's increasing. So <laughs> right? it's enjoy it while it lasts, right? So, but this is one of these things where we do, and the pace here is what's difficult in some ways, is you do, how do you come up with common understandings on the use of new weapons, right? And some of that has to be through bodies like the UN. Some of it has to be through bodies like the ICRC. There's other international fora like this London process. Um, and then there's bilateral discussion. So a lot of the bilateral discussion, I believe, with the Chinese, for example, has been on you know, potential military use. So I think this is just one of these things where we're going to have to talk our way through and where we want to bear in mind that, unsurprisingly, there will be political agendas right, mm -hmm. that try and shape the debate. And some of those agendas are not in our national interest. So we have to take, I think, a strong position of what best serves the United States and can be consistent with international law. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. My name is Ron Seaman. I'm from Ron Seaman Ministries. And um, what my concern is, we can see um, all of the uh, cyber attacks that take down power plants or grids or banks, insurance companies. But what I'm concerned about is uh, the unspoken, which is the, the manipulation of hundreds of thousands of social media accounts through automation and controlling the politics and controlling the impact on the ground. And I was just wondering if that just falls under the covert laws and so it's just ignored. Um, I give you, and then you can, you can give the right answer. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's uh, so I, uh, I, last summer I learned that you could, um, you could uh, uh, buy uh, Twitter followers, right? Which I really, I've thought about doing it. And, um, you know. Boost your numbers? Yeah, I mean, so when you read Wasn't that expensive? some, uh, I didn't get that far. Uh, you, when you read that some rapper has four million followers, the actual number might be, uh, this was from a friend who worked at a, uh, one of these hip hop newsletters. Um, 
their actual number might be like 1.5. So it's, it's easier to manipulate the social media than we think. And the same is true for Facebook and LinkedIn. It's easier to use the data from them for uh, data mining. Um, I talked to one of the big data miners and they use feeds from social media as predictive. That's, I think there's been stuff in the paper. You can predict disease, uh, unemployment, car purchases. You can predict all sorts of things from being able to, to <laughs> harvest this data. Because um, people can't resist putting things on social networks. You think like, why, why do I care? Arm now covered with red dots, right? It's like, so what? But people do that enough that you can predict disease outbreaks. And governments have not been slow to recognize the utility of social networks, first for intelligence purposes. Uh, you can uh, mine social networks, you can create false identities, you could use it for targeting. Um, most large intelligence agencies, I think it's safe to say, outside the US um, exploit social media. The notion of shaping opinion, though, is, is a difficult one, and I think it depends largely on national law. So I don't see um, some countries uh, put a lot more effort into this than you might think. So the Chinese have um, bloggers who they hire, uh, I think they call them the 50 cent army, maybe it's the 10 cent, I can't, it depends on the value of yuan on any given day, who purposely enter positive things about the Chinese government. Um, the Russians, of course, I mentioned earlier, have a doctrine that focuses on political shaping. So it's an area where the, the one of these areas of ambiguity, uh, what are the rules for this? This is where transparency would help. I myself don't believe anything I read on the internet unless I can confirm it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's an issue for laws of armed conflict. No, it's not an issue um, for the ICRC as a matter of fact, but I could give you perhaps a, an answer as, as a person. I just um, was in a, in a management seminar as a matter of fact last week and, and we saw there how um, these means can really also be used uh, as, a, as a means of attacks against uh, whoever you want. I mean, um, you can attack um, a corporation, you can attack a person politically. And I think there we, we are really um, in a sphere where we have also to look if, if in a certain way freedom is not just um, killing itself. I, I mean, it, it's really sometimes uh, quite difficult if you overflow um, the somebody with, with information. And there I think it's, it's like you, you have, we have to be extremely critical and just be very, very aware what we are believing and what we are not believing and look that we are not based just on one one information because it's 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 in politics i think it can be quite dangerous i think i'm really from taking from this conversation the power of shaping the political agenda in some ways is a is a more powerful than i had anticipated we had a question right here thanks I'm Hillary Lewis. I'm actually with the George Washington University Executive MBA program. We have a focus on cybersecurity. So I thank you for having the event. It's been wonderful. I have a question that's going to kind of weave a couple of things together. Um, in the context of cyber attacks happening as a component of an overall kinetic attack, which is frequently how they're conceived of in military operations, how, how does the idea that you need, uh, in, in order to have a legitimate target, you need that individual to be involved in a, what is a continuous combat, combatant function. When you consider a cyber attack as an element of an overall ongoing kinetic or international armed conflict, how, do you, how can you target someone whose element is only in, is intransigent? It's something where maybe you set up a di distributed denial of services, then you sit back. And that attack is ongoing, but there's no individual managing it thanks to botnets. So how do you, how does the idea of a legitimate target must be someone who's currently engaged, how does that marry with this idea that cyber allows people to be disengaged? I'll go first. Um, one of the things uh, that I hope doesn't get eroded uh, is the notion that uh, under current uh, international law, uh, any target can be legitimate if there's overriding military necessity, right? 
So for me, I think that's really important. And when you think about the history of warfare, uh, targets that we would, this, sorry, targets that we would regard as civilian uh, critical infrastructure um, are routinely attacked, right? And they're routinely attacked both in insurgencies and in conventional warfare. And this goes back to um, probably at least World War II, maybe. I don't think it was, that would be the best one to look at. And that one's always my favorite because at uh, the beginning of the war, Franklin Roosevelt sent a letter to um, Hitler and to Churchill, right? Saying that air warfare was so terrible that could they both agree not to attack civilian targets? And amazingly, they both agreed that they wouldn't attack civilian targets, right? I forget how many days the agreement lasted. So civilian targets are legitimate, right? And then we have to think under what conditions are they legitimate, right? And that would be one of these problems that we haven't worked through. I mean, that's what you said before. If, if you discuss under the condition that you are really in a situation of armed conflict, um, I think that the, the attack can be done, but you have to um, respect the principles you also mentioned before. I mean, the proportionality, the distinction, all the, the big principles of IHL are applicable also in this case. That has to have to be respected. My name is Andrew Yu from uh, Deutsche Bank. Um, I have a question about w what is the appropriate uh, doctrine of deterrence um, when it comes to cyber attacks? Because it, because it seems that um, cyber attacks have a, a, a huge potential for destruction. Um, and yet, it, it doesn't seem possible in all circumstances to uh, draw an analogy, a direct analogy between, say, uh, nuclear deterrence because of the question of attribution. Um, yet, at the same time, you, you can't necessarily draw a, a, a direct analogy between, say, a counterinsurgency because um, the, the um, destructive effects of a counterinsurgency may not um, be the same as that for uh, um, as the the damage that can be affected by um, uh, by a, a, a cyber attack. So I was wondering what 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 your thoughts are on that. Okay. Um, well, one of the things I like about uh, cyber is you can put the word cyber in front of anything, right? <laughs> and so that's really great. Like I. To, you know, and we, I'm surprised we haven't talked about cyber drones today. You really, we deserve some credit for avoiding temptation. Um, and cyber deterrence is uh, one of those uh, places where it's inappropriate, in my view, to put the word in front. And this might be a larger problem with strategic thinking in the U.S. We keep hearkening back to the Eisenhower administration and how do we get a grand strategy and how do we come up with deterrence. I actually don't believe there is such a thing as cyber deterrence. And I say that for two reasons. Uh, first, instead of a single opponent who is a peer and mere image as us, um, we have multiple classes of opponents with very different tolerance for risk, right? And very different abilities to calculate risk, right? Uh, second, it's easy to make a credible threat uh, with a nuclear weapon. And to be a credible deterrent threat, the threat has to pose existential damage. Existential, existential damage to the state. Now I get to be an arms controller, right? And so a cyber attack, it's really not gonna be that destructive, right? Um, we could talk about how destructive, but it's not going to create existential risk, right? Outside of military conflict, it will not threaten the political independence or the territorial integrity of the nation, which are the criteria in the UN Charter, right? So if you can't make a credible threat, and the opponents have different ways of calculating risk, you're not gonna be able to deter, deter them, right? General deterrence still works. Russia and China are deterred from attacking the US, right? But they're not deterred from cyber actions, in part because of the threshold issues. Espionage doesn't justify military, a military response. Mm -hmm. Crime doesn't justify a military response. So we cannot deter them. And so I see people always trying to resuscitate deterrence along with other Cold War ideas. Someone was asking me about collective defense the other day. It just gave me a headache. Right? Um, so I'm not uh, not a big fan. Perhaps just one um, addition. I mean, the strengths or the weakness of, of cyber can also be its strengths. 
because the whole cyber world is, is so um, diversified and is mainly private. And because it's mainly private, it's also um, very difficult to attack as a whole. So it's, it's very, uh, if you attack some place, uh, there will be an, on another place again, um, a private initiative coming up. And so I think this is in a certain way also deterrence that it is so diversified and very private. I'm Stanley Kober. The subject of sanctuaries came up. That was also the case in Vietnam. Okay, We bombed and bombed North Vietnam. In the end, it did not work. We left. And then they didn't just bomb and bomb. They invaded South Vietnam and took it over. Boots on the ground. And then when they had problems with the Khmer Rouge, they didn't just bomb. They sent in their army and cleaned out the Khmer Rouge the way a dentist cleans out an infection in a root canal. They just cleaned them out. Khmer Rouge have not been heard from again. That's war, okay? My father was in Poland in 1939 when the war started. And once he referred to the start of the war in 1941, and I gently corrected him. And he turned and looked at me scornfully and said, that was no war. By discussing cyber and drones, are we in effect admitting that we are no longer capable of war? That's a really good question. And, um, you know, I, I would rephrase it a little differently, which is are we capable of winning wars, right? So we can engage in armed conflict, uh, but can they be won? And you know, clearly, you, then you'd want to sort of review the record. Where have we been able to uh, uh, actually win? I do think that it is fair to say that in most cases, when you look at successful counterinsurgencies, they have physically occupied the sanctuary, right? And that's been necessary. In this particular case, I'd say the goal here is more to disrupt uh, planning and organizations that might be plotting attacks against the U.S. rather than um, the kind of counterinsurgent goals. But, th but that's an open point. So um, I think the larger question, there's a fair question to say, can anyone, can you still win a war? And this is, if you remember, uh, Bernard Brody wrote in the 50s that the purpose of militaries had changed, where previously they had been created uh, to win wars, and now they would, their main mission would be to exist and thus prevent wars. And Brody's point is still valid. I don't think it's perfectly accurate anymore, but that's, that's the question we want to ask is, it's easy to start a war, it's really hard to win one. Hi, uh, Marco Bulma from um, the Joint Center for Earth Systems Technology uh, and recent experience in NATO headquarters. Um, I've heard something a little bit different to what I was thinking I was coming to today. Um, I'm intrigued by your title, Battlefield. Um, those of us operating within these sorts of spaces are really thinking battle space more than battlefield. So I was intrigued as to why you might have chosen battlefield um, for, for the topic today. And the two things that you've chosen here, cyber and drones, um, they are part of a continuum. I, I would certainly go along with that. But I think what they've highlighted for us, sort of trying to work within those spaces, is um, we are often having to operate over significant distances. And as a result of that, we're operating at different speeds. Um, and part of that is just pure physics. We're operating halfway around the world. And the other, obviously, is biological, the thinking piece here. Both of those technologies allow more information to be put forward. And they've really changed where we think of tactical situations and strategic situations. And, and it's really quite revolutionary what's gone on. Um, so I think my question is this. Given that a drone operator is capable of seeing more and is able 
with higher resolution to better discriminate and to get to all those things that be, we've been wanting to get to uh, in terms of proportionality, distinction, discrimination, di discrimination. We're getting there, but we're now introducing more people into this. Going to Christine, what we continually need is access to the law and, and what is written and how it's written. And I guess my question for both of you is, do you think that the way that the law is currently presented is adequately fit for purpose and fit for role for those people who are having to operate within these spaces and make these decisions? Thank you. I mean, this is a very interesting um, question, and I think we have to think about this all the time, and, and we, we try also, because the law um, can for sure not be just taken and applied um, like it is because it's, it's extremely complicated, it's very abstract, and it has to be put in, in rules where you can um, see it much more concrete and you can use it I in the situation where you are put and where you have to deci decide on the spot. And that's why we try also uh, to have um, a very in-depth going discussion with, with military personnel and we try to bring the rules of law into their rules of, of command, finally, and, and really to, to bring them the ideas which are put in, in the international humanitarian law very close so that they can apply them in the situation where they stand. And I have um, had the possibility to, to take part at, at quite a lot of those seminaries where we speak also with, with really commanding officers and ask them, what do you need? Because it's not, it's not us as lawyers uh, who know exactly what they need in the moment where they have to decide. And that's why I think it's extremely important that we have um, a very close dialogue with those people that we can bring them really the the means they need to take rational and good decisions. Um, some of what we want to look for in the future is um, the automation of decision support. Right? So there's floods of data. There's more data than anyone can possibly digest. And so you have to develop techniques, machines, that programs that will do it for you. And that means you need to think what are the rules that you will build into those programs. And the example I always use is, it may not be a good one, um, Wall Street, where automated trading is fairly routine. Traders get delivered to their desktop information they can use to make decisions. So part of it is looking to ways to automate decision support, which is a little different from weapons. Now, let me, I'm going to do this because we're coming towards the end, so, and you've been a very patient audience. Are there any former Marines in the, in the audience? Good. So, um, <laughs> good. So, what is the marine word for helicopter? <laughs> right. And I say that because uh, one of the decisions the U.S. has made is to treat cyber, in particular, as another source of fire. Right. So it's just another weapon system. It's like a rifle, or a, uh, or an artillery round, or it's it's a shaping. You know, it's a support weapon. It shapes the battlefield so far, um, but making it simple in some ways for combatants to understand is, is one of the crucial points, right? Not to, not to denigrate their intelligence, but if you're under tremendous stress, you, you're going to make decisions based on um, relatively simple concepts. And so when I think about this, the laws of armed conflict, the international humanitarian law, seem to me to be perfectly appropriate, but we need to translate them into doctrine for the use of both uh, all the new weapons, right? And the doctrine then has to be translated into rules of engagement. You know, when, what a commander has to think about um, when they actually make, what a combatant has to think about when they go to use the weapon. And then finally that has to be incorporated into training. And so very few countries are very far along this path of going from doctrine down to training and how to use. I will say that in the U.S. probably is, is a bit of a surprise because of the lack of clarity over rules of engagement, over doctrine, which is changing, there's been a real reluctance, a real caution to use uh, some of these techniques. Hard to believe, I know, but 
when you talk to the military commanders at say the, the 06, the one star, the three star level, they, um, they express a degree of caution until they get a clear understanding of the rules of engagement, how the laws of armed conflict apply. Mm -hmm. Perhaps just, I, I still think that it's extremely important and that's why I, I told before or I said that we should have this um, relationship with, with the commanders. I think decisions are, are still to be made by men uh, and we have, to, we have to have the connection and we have to explain to them how the rules work and how they can be applicable in the, momen in the moment where it's crucial. If we um, have too much trust in, 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 in machines or computers, just because you mentioned the one of Wall Street, I mean, if you have seen how the stock markets went down uh, two weeks ago, I think when just this gossip was around that there was a shooting in Washington, just wham, going down, going up again. So I, 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 I don't have <laughs> such a lot of trust in, 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 in machines and in computer programs, so I think it's still better if if weapons are commanded by men and uh, not by computer programs. <laughs> well, just on a footnote on that, though, when you look at the, uh, uh, the Patriot or the Phalanx, uh, two air defense systems, um, that are uh, programmed to take action automatically. And when you look at their initial deployments, there was a high rate of error, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Phalanx used to, you know, seagulls that were too close and performed a would the phalanx would engage, um, <laughs> which was bad, yeah. right? Bad for the seagull. But over time, I think you can refine the programs, the automation, so that the weapon uh, will be able to, there will ultimately at the end be a human making a decision, but that decision may involve general parameters which are then delegated mm -hmm. to the machine. I think we have to move that way. Do you things. think that you can put the rules of international humanitarian law into the computer, that he acts afterwards as if he would respect this? Uh, yeah, I think so, right? I think he would have, the fundamental decision would be, um, when do I turn it on, right? And then you would want to make a decision of, am I turning it on in a context that is consistent with international law, mm -hmm. right? Where there are combatants that I can identify and that we are in a conflict situation. If you can't say those things, then no, don't turn it on, right? Mm -hmm. But I think yes, at the end of the day, you still will have a human making a decision about is, are the laws of armed conflict of applicable? Mm -hmm. I feel another CSIS seminar coming on. Um, uh, we're, we're at our time. Jim, I just want to remind you that there may not be former Marines or former Marines in the room, but they may be watching us on video. So if you get a couple of emails, I just wanted to, to warn you. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I learned a great deal. I learned from our audience, which I always learn from our audience. But Christine and Jim, thank you so much. It's these types of events that we can both understand ICRC's critical role, that we can have a debate, a uh, respectful debate, and, uh, and still at the end of this, I think we have more questions than answers, which means we need to dig into this more. And I feel smarter when I read the President's speech on Thursday, I'm gonna look for a couple of things uh, based on this conversation. So again, please join me in thanking Christine and Jim for a great presentation. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.